Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter thirty three In the Sun A Harbinger A week passed, and there were no tidings of Bathsheba, nor was there any explanation of her Gilpin's rig. Then a note came from Mary Ann, stating that the business which had called her mistress to Bath still detained her there, but that she hoped to return in the course of another week. Another week passed. The oat harvest began, and all the men were afield under a monochromatic glamour sky, amid the trembling air and short shadows of noon. Indoors nothing was to be heard save the droning of bluebottle flies. Out of doors the whetting of scythes and the hiss of tressy oat-ears rubbing together as their perpendicular stalks of amber-yellow fell heavily to each swathe. Every drop of moisture, not in the men's bottles and flagons in the form of cider, was raining as perspiration from their foreheads and cheeks. Drought was everywhere else. They were about to withdraw for a while into the charitable shade of a tree in the fence, when Coggan saw a figure in a blue coat and brass buttons running to them across the field. "'I wonder who that is,' he said. "'I hope nothing is wrong about mistress.' said Mary Ann, who, with some other women, was tying the bundles, oats always been sheafed on this farm. But an unlucky token came to me indoors this morning. I went to unlock the door and drop the key, and it fell upon the stone floor and broke into two pieces. Breaking a key is a dreadful bodement. I wish Mrs. was home. "'Tis came ball," said Gabriel, pausing from whetting his repuck. Oak was not bound by his agreement to assist in the cornfield, but the harvest month is an anxious time for a farmer, and the corn was Bathsheba's, so he lent a hand. "'He's dressed up in his best clothes,' said Matthew Moon. "'He's been away from home for a few days since he's had that felon upon his finger, for he said, "'Since I can't work, I'll have all our day.' "'A good time for one, a excellent time.' said Joseph Poorgrass, straightening his back, for he, like some of the others, had a way of resting a while from his labour, on such hot days, for reasons preternaturally small, of which Cain Ball's advent on a weekday in his Sunday clothes was one of the first magnitude. "'Twas a bad leg allowed me to read the Pilgrim's Progress, and Mark Clark learnt all fours in a whitlow. "'Ay, and my father put his arm out a joint to have time to go to courtin', said Jan Coggan in an eclipsing tone, wiping his face with his shirt-sleeve and thrusting back his hat upon the nape of his neck. By this time Caney was nearing the group of harvesters, and was perceived to be carrying a large slice of bread and ham in one hand, from which he took mouthfuls as he ran, the other being wrapped in a bandage. When he came close his mouth assumed the bell-shape, and he began to cough violently. "'Now, Caney,' said Gabriel sternly, how many more times must I tell you to keep from running so fast when you be eaten? You choke yourself some day. That's what you'll do, Cain Ball. <coughs> <coughs> replied Cain. The crumb of my victuals went the wrong way. <coughs> That's what it is, Mr. Oak. And I've been visiting to Bath because I had a felon on my thumb. Yes, and I've seen... <coughs> Directly Cain mentioned Bath, they all threw down their hooks and forks and drew around him. Unfortunately, the erratic crumb did not improve his narrative powers, and a supplementary hindrance was that of a sneeze, jerking from his pocket his rather large watch, which dangled in front of the young man, pendulum-wise. Yes, he continued, directing his thoughts to Bath and letting his eyes follow. I've seen the world at last, <coughs> and I've seen our missus. <coughs> "'Bother the boy,' said Gabriel. "'Something is always going the wrong way down your throat, "'so that you can't tell what's necessary to be told.' <coughs> "'There, please, Mr. Oak, "'a gnat have just slid into my stomach "'and brought the cough on again.' "'Yes, that's just it. "'Your mouth is always open, you young rascal.' "'Tis terrible bad to have a gnat fly down your throat, "'poor boy,' said Matthew Moon. "'Well, that bath you saw.' prompted Gabriel. "'I saw her mistress,' continued the junior shepherd, "'and a soldier walking along. "'And by me boy they got closer and closer, "'and then they went arm and crook, "'like court and complete. <coughs> "'Like court and complete. <coughs> "'Court and complete. 
Losing the thread of his narrative at this point, simultaneously with his loss of breath, their informant looked up and down the field, apparently for some clue to it. "'Well, I see our missus and a soldier. <coughs> <laughs> "'Damn the boy,' said Gabriel. "'Tis only me manner, Mr. Oak, if you'll excuse it,' said Caneball, looking reproachfully at Oak, with eyes drenched in their own dew. "'Here's some cider for him. That'll cure his throat.' said Jan Coggan, lifting a flagon of cider, and pulling out the cork and applying the whole to Caney's mouth, Joseph Poorgrass in the meantime, beginning to think apprehensively of the serious consequences that would follow Caney Ball's strangulation in his cough, and the history of his bath adventures dying with him. "'For my poor self, I always say, please God, afore I do anything,' said Joseph, in an unboastful voice. "'And so should you, Cain Ball.' "'Tis a great safeguard, and might perhaps save you from being choked to death some day.' Mr. Coggan poured the liquor with unstinted liberality at the suffering cane's circular mouth, half of it running down the side of the flagon, and half of what reached his mouth running down the outside of his throat, and half of what ran in going the wrong way, and being coughed and sneezed around the persons of the gathered reapers in the form of a cider-fog, which for a moment hung in the sunny air like a small exhalation. "'There's a great clumsy sneeze. Why can't ye have better manners, ye young dog?' said Coggan, withdrawing the flagon. "'Cider went up my nose!' cried Caney, as soon as he could speak. "'And now tis gone down my neck, and into my poor dumb felon, and over my shiny buttons and all my best clothes.' "'The poor lad's cough is terrible unfortunate,' said Matthew Moon, "'and a great history on hand, too. A bump his back, Shepherd.' "'Tis my nater, mourned Cain. "'Mother says I always was so excitable when my feelings were worked up to a point.' "'True, true,' said Joseph Poorgrass. "'The Balls always were a very excitable family. "'I know the boy's grandfather, a truly nervous and modest man, "'even to genteel refinery. "'Twas blush, blush with him, almost as much as it is with me. "'Not but that it's a fault in me.' "'Not at all, Master Poorgrass,' said Coggan. "'Tis a very noble quality in ye.' <laughs> "'Well, I wish to know he's nothing abroad, nothing at all,' murmured Poorgrass diffidently. "'But we be born to things, that's true. Yet I would rather my trifle were hid, though perhaps a high nater is a little high, and at my birth all things were possible to my Maker, and he may have begrudged no gifts. But under your bushel, Joseph, under your bushel we.' A strange desire, neighbours, this desire to hide and no praise due. Yet there is a sermon on the mount with a calendar of the blessed at the head, and certain meek men may be named therein. Caney's grandfather was a very clever man, said Matthew Moon, invented a apple tree out of his own head, which is called by his name today the early ball. You know him, Jan, a quarrenden grafted from a tom pot, and a rather ripe upon top of that again. "'Tis true, I used to bide about in a public house with a woman in a way he had no business to buy rights, but there, I were a clever man in the sense of the term. "'Now then,' said Gabriel impatiently, "'what did you see, Cain?' "'I seed our missus go into a sort of park place, where there's seats and shrubs and flowers, arm and crook with a soldier.' continued Cain firmly, and with a dim sense that his words were very effective as regarded Gabriel's emotions. And I think the soldier was Sergeant Troy, and they sat together for more than half an hour, talking moving things, and she once was crying almost to death, and when they came out her eyes were shining, and she was as white as a lily, and they looked into one another's faces as far gone friendly as a man and woman can be. Gabriel's features seemed to get thinner. "'Well, what did you see besides?' "'Oh, all sorts. "'White as a lily. "'You were sure t'was she?' "'Oh, yes.' "'Well, what besides?' "'Great glass windows to the shops, "'and great clouds in the sky, full of rain, "'and old wooden trees in the country round.' "'You stone, Paul. "'What'll you say next?' said Coggan. "'Lettin' alone.' interposed Joseph Poorgrass. The boy's meaning is that the sky and earth in the kingdom of Bath is not altogether different from ours here. It is for our good to gain knowledge of strange cities, and as such the boy's words should be suffered, so to speak it. 
and the people of Bath, continued Cain, never need to light their fires except as a luxury, for the water springs up out of the earth ready boiled for use. Tis true as the light, testified Matthew Moon. I've heard other navigators say the same thing. They drink nothing else there, said Cain, and seem to enjoy it to see how they swallow it down. Well, it seems a barbarian practice enough to us, but I dare say the natives think nothing of it, said Matthew. And don't victuals spring up as well as drink? asked Coggan, twirling his eye. No, I own to a blot there in Bath, a true blot. God didn't provide him with victuals as well as drink, and t'was a drawback I couldn't get over at all. Well, tis a curious place, to say the least, observed Moon, and there must be a curious people that live therein. Is Everdeen and the soldier were walking about together, you say? said Gabriel, returning to the group. Aye, and she wore a beautiful gold-coloured silk gown, trimmed with black lace, that would have stood alone without legs inside if required. It was a very winsome sight, and her hair was brushed splendid, and when the sun shone upon the bright gown and his red coat, my, how handsome they looked! You could see them all the length of the street. And what then? murmured Gabriel. And then I went to Griffin's to have me boots hobbed. And then I went to Riggs's batty cake shop, and asked them for a penneth of the cheapest and nicest stales, that were all but blue mouldy, and but not quite. And whilst I was charring them down, I walked on, and see that clock with a face as big as a bacon trendle. But that's nothing to do with mistress. I'm coming to that if you leave me alone, Mr. Oak, remonstrated Caney. If you excites me, perhaps you'll bring on my cough, and then I shan't be able to tell you nothing. "'Yes, let him tell it his own way,' said Coggan. Gabriel settled into a despairing attitude of patience, and Caney went on. "'And there were great large houses, and more people all the week long than at Weathery Walking Club on White Tuesdays. And I went to grand churches and chapels, and how the parson would pray. Yes, he would kneel down and put up his hands together, and make the holy gold rings on his fingers gleam and twinkle in your eyes.' "'that he'd earned by praying so excellent well. "'Ah, yes, I wish I lived there.' "'Our poor parson thoroughly can't get no money to buy such rings,' "'said Matthew Moon thoughtfully. "'And as good a man as ever walked. "'I don't believe poor thoroughly have a single one, "'even of the humblest tin or copper. "'Such a great ornament as they be to him on a dull afternoon, "'when he's up in the pulpit lighted by the wax candles. "'But tis impossible, poor man. "'Ah, to think how unequal things be.' "'Perhaps he's made of different stuff than to wear em, said Gabriel grimly. "'Well, that's enough of this. Go on, Caney, quick.' "'Oh, and the new style of parsons wear moustaches and long beards,' continued the illustrious traveller, "'and look like Moses and Aaron complete, and make we folks in the congregation feel all over like the children of Israel.' "'A very right feeling, very,' said Joseph Poorgrass. "'And there's two religions going on in the nation now?' High Church and High Chapel, and, thinks I, I'll play fair. So I went to High Church in the morning, and High Chapel in the afternoon. A right and proper boy, said Joseph Poorgrass. Well, a High Church they pray singing, and worship all the colours of the rainbow, and a High Chapel they pray preaching, and worship drab and whitewash only, and then I didn't see no more of Mrs. Everdeen at all. Oh, why didn't you say so afore, then? exclaimed Oak, with much disappointment. Ah, said Matthew Moon, she'll wish her cake dough if so be she's over intimate with that man. She's not over intimate with him, said Gabriel indignantly. She should know better, said Coggan. Our missus has too much sense under they knots of black hair to do such a mad thing. You see, he's not a coarse, ignorant man, for he was well brought up, said Matthew dubiously. "'Twas only wildness that made him a soldier, and made rather like your man a sin. "'Now, came Ball, said Gabriel restlessly, "'can you swear in the most awful form that the woman you saw was Miss Everdeen?' "'Cain Ball, you no longer be a babe in suckling,' said Joseph, in the sepulchral tone the circumstances demanded. "'And you know what taking an oath is. "'Tis a horrible testament, mind ye, "'which you should say and seal with your bloodstone, "'and the prophet Matthew tells us "'that on whomsoever it shall fall "'it will grind him to powder. "'Now, before all the work-folk here assembled, 
Can you swear to your words, as the shepherd asks ye? Please, no, Mr. Oak, said Caney, looking from one to the other with great uneasiness at the spiritual magnitude of the position. I don't mind saying tis true, but I don't like to say tis damn true, if that's what you mean. Cain, Cain, how can you? asked Joseph sternly. You be asked to swear in a holy manner, and you swear like wicked Shimei, the son of Gera, who cursed as he came. Young man, fie! No, I don't. Tis you want to squander a poor boy's soul, Joseph Poorgrass, that's what tis, said Cain, beginning to cry. All I mean is that in common truth, twas Miss Everdeen and Sergeant Troy, but in the horrible so help me truth that you want to make of it, perhaps twas somebody else. There's no getting to the rights of it said Gabriel, turning to his work. "'Cain Ball, you'll come to a bit of bread,' groaned Joseph Poorgrass. Then the reaper's hooks were flourished again, and the old sounds went on. Gabriel, without making any pretense of being lively, did nothing to show that he was particularly dull. However, Coggan knew pretty nearly how the land lay, and when they were in a nook together he said, "'Don't take on about her, Gabriel.' "'What difference does it make whose sweetheart she is, since she can't be yours?' "'That's the very thing I say to myself,' said Gabriel. End of chapter 33